Hello, everybody. This is a real honor to be meeting with Simone Dupuri this morning, who is one of the world's most significant auctioneers and a real talent and someone who thoroughly, I, I think, you know, more than anyone else I can think of, someone who understands the art market and the art world globally. Um, there are lots of ways that I would like to um, conduct this discussion this morning, but Simone, you were, Ray, you were born in Switzerland, correct? Correct. I was born in Basel, uh, which is a small city in the German part of Switzerland, and a city which always was very much open to art and culture, and it has its great art fair, the Basel Art Fair, uh, which meanwhile is also in Miami, the Basel Miami, and which next year is opening in Hong Kong, the Basel Hong Kong Fair. And it has a fabulous um, main museum. It has an amazing Viola Foundation. So it's a great place for art. Um, it strikes me that perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, growing up in Switzerland stamps you with an international attitude towards culture. I think that Europe, <coughs> particularly, well, all of Europe, is much more interested in culture than I think the United States is. And I think that Switzerland is the most international of countries and that you get more influences artistically from different directions besides having a sufficient number historically of your own great artists. So that you grow up to be an international figure in the art world doesn't seem unusual coming from Switzerland. Uh, I think you are correct in the sense that Switzerland is a tiny country uh, which touches on various uh, neighboring countries. We have four national languages, uh, Romance, Italian, French, and German. And so we are forced to be open on what is happening outside of the country. And Switzerland is made up of many different uh, nationalities of people from many different origins. And so uh, traditionally, Switzerland is a country that has had a large number of artists, also a large number of collectors. So it is always a very active place in the uh, contemporary art scene. When you do arithmetic, what language do you do it in? I actually don't know. I mean, I, my mother tongue is French, so I, the first six years of my life I spoke French, but then I did all my schools in German, so it will be either in French or German. Fabulous. And then ultimately you, you also, I mean, did you grow up speaking English or did you have to study it? I... At school, I spoke, I mean, I spoke, I learned uh, Greek and Latin. So when I was 17, I was sent to Cambridge in a kind of summer course, and that's where I uh, learned it. And Japanese? Uh, Japanese, I had the privilege when I finished school uh, in Switzerland to go to Tokyo and uh, take courses at the Tokyo Academy of Arts uh, the, and uh, took courses in uh, Japanese brush painting and Nihonga, which is a technique of uh, painting with uh, minerals. And uh, so when I was in Tokyo, I learned a little bit of Japanese, but it's really rudimentary. And while you were there, you determined that you were going to be an artist? Yes, I wanted to become an artist. That was my initial dream when I was a teenager. And uh, I suddenly saw, you know, thousands at the, the Tokyo Academy of Arts that shared that same dream. And uh, when I was a teenager, I was convinced that I was the greatest artist of the second half of the 20th century. And then I realized that maybe that conviction was uh, not completely justified. And um, I, you know, eventually had to see that maybe the second best thing to being an artist was working uh, in the art field and being surrounded by artworks. You know, one of the things we discuss in this class a lot is relationships and how one accomplishes their objectives. I thought the story of you and Nodler and Castelli was rather interesting and, you know, and, and, and reveals to some extent ultimately how one finds their way in the art world is either by a chance of prepare, being prepared and serendipity. But can you talk about the Nodler Castelli experience briefly? Yes, I mean, when I finished uh, my courses in Tokyo, I had to go back to Switzerland to do my military service. And so instead of going straight back to Switzerland, I went via uh, New York, which uh, then and today still can be considered the capital of the art world. And so I took a portfolio under my arm 
and I didn't know anybody in the art world, so I bought the New York Times when I arrived in uh, New York, and I looked at which galleries had the largest ads that day, and there were three galleries with the largest ads. Uh, the, the very largest ad was Nodler Gallery, uh, so I went and uh, asked to see Mr. Nodler, and I was politely told that there was no Mr. Nodler, that was just the name of the gallery, and a, an assistant uh, did not even look at my work, and five minutes later I was back on the street. Then the second largest ad uh, that day in the paper was uh, Leo Castelli, so I went to the Castelli gallery, asked to see Leo Castelli, and I was told that he wasn't there, and um, again an, uh, an assistant told me no, that they were dealing predominantly in American artists, and I wasn't able to show my work, and I was back in the street. So I had decided I'm only going to a third gallery, and that will determine uh, if I become an artist or not. And I went to the third gallery, there was a lovely secretary there, and uh, she said, well, uh, why don't you leave your work here, the director is not here, but uh, leave your portfolio here, come back in two hours, and I will, meanwhile I will show your portfolio to the director. So I walked around Central Park uh, during those two hours, and I thought these are the two decisive hours of my life. And I went back to the gallery, and she was really, really lovely, the, the, that uh, young lady, and she told me, listen, uh, Master such, Mr. Such-and-so loved your work, and I had already shaky knees, uh, but it's not exactly the kind of stuff we deal in. So uh, I was back in the street and um, called up my, I mean, I did not call my parents, because at the time, you know, communications and telephones were costing a fortune, but I uh, eventually informed my parents that I had decided to study law, and so they thought, thought at long, long, long last, uh, some had seen reason, and um, but when I started studying law, uh, after three weeks, I saw that this was clearly not at all what I was interested in, and uh, I just missed the art of looking at art, and that's when I went to see Ernst Beiler, who was the main art dealer from Basel, and he was at the time internationally probably the biggest dealer worldwide. Uh, he was dealing in Impressionist and Modern Art, showing the best works by uh, Matisse, Picasso, Giacometti, uh, all the great masters of the 20th century. And uh, he told me, uh, I asked him, should I study history of art or should I go into the art market? And he told me, don't study history of art because you will never be in physical touch with the artworks. The only thing to do is to go directly into the art market because there you'll be in daily physical touch with the artworks. And so I decided to follow his advice quite literally, and I did exactly what he told me initially, and I never regretted it. So I'm eternally grateful to him to have finally put me onto the right, step, uh, uh, right footage. So ultimately you discovered what resonated and what felt most appropriate for you, right? Well, my approach to art is really uh, purely physical. I just love uh, being in daily touch with artworks, uh, also with artists, and uh, the first day that I started then really in that uh, uh, field, I, I, I just loved it, and I love wait, it wait, wait, to the day. Time. There's no routine in that field, so every single day I feel I'm so privileged to be doing what I'm doing. So I want, I want more clarity. When Hans Beiler said that you should be physically in touch with artwork on a daily basis, did you become an art installer or an art mover or something else? <laughs> Well, uh, he told me to go to a small auction company in Bern, uh, which is called Kornfeld. It's a gallery that is specialized in prints and drawings, and that once a year is uh, having auctions. And uh, that was a very good advice, because uh, since it's a very small company, uh, you learn all aspects of the uh, work in a, in a gallery or auction company. So I had to do... Uh, I had to clean up the floors, I had to learn how to uh, package the artworks, I had to hold them during the auctions, and sometimes there were these heavy sculptures, and I'm not very strong, and so uh, during the bidding I thought, I hope they will at long last uh, stop bidding, otherwise I will drop the sculpture on the floor. <laughs> and um, I was looking over the shoulders of A.B. Kornfeld while he was cataloging, so I was really learning all aspects um, uh, of the art market, but the beauty of it is that every single day I, I was able to handle uh, gorgeous works like uh, 
in, in, I did it a few centuries ago, of course, but uh, we, we were handling incredible works by Picasso, Max Ernst, uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, the German Expressionist, uh, Edvard Monk, and so on and so on. Your ascent in the art world has an, I don't see it as quite linear. I think that forming a partnership with Philips was of major significance. Is that one of the highlights? Well, it's certainly been the most exciting part of my professional career. I feel very privileged because I loved every uh, aspect of what I've done and I've learned to see the art world from different perspectives. I mean, uh, I started, as I said, as, a, as an artist, not a particularly successful one, but then uh, I've seen it from the perspective of an art dealer, dealer from the perspective of a gallery. Uh, then uh, later on, I uh, had the privilege of seeing it also uh, from the perspective of a curator or museum director, because I worked for a number of years for uh, Baron Tissen, who in the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s was the most active collector worldwide. And so that was a very exciting uh, period for me because I was able to organize exhibitions um, and uh, get to know a lot of curators, museum directors, and artists around the world. And, um, and then I've spent uh, 16 years at Sotheby's, which also was immensely exciting. And I was uh, chairman of Sotheby's Europe and chief auctioneer for the company. And so uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I had the chance of getting involved with Philips. And I initially merged the dealing company that I had in the late 1990s with Philips. And then in 2003, uh, took over the majority of the company. And uh, together with a group of uh, highly talented colleagues, we decided to focus just on a few key areas. And these are uh, contemporary art, uh, photography, and design. And by really being completely focused on these uh, areas, uh, we've been very, very successful at it. And uh, I think that we are in the secondary market now, the, probably the main company who introduces new talent uh, to the auction market. And uh, we've done it now systematically in the contemporary field, but we've equally done it in the photography and in the design field. I think it's been wonderful and remarkable. And then, <clears throat> then you had this perhaps tangential interest of participating in a TV series, Work of Art, The Next Great Artist. and has, it, has that augmented your reputation and your star status and the number of people who flock in your wake as you walk through the airport? No, it hasn't really made much change at all. I mean, it was, it was a very fun and pleasurable experience because when I was approached, uh, I was delighted to participate in it because I always feel that art is not just there for a small group of insiders and uh, of uh, affluent people who can afford it. Art is, uh, has universal appeal in the same way uh, that music instantly speaks to us, art instantly speaks to us. I'm just as obsessed about music that I am about art. Where one, uh, out of one I do my living and out of the other one, the other one is, is my passion at the same time. Now, uh, sorry, I, I, I have the laptop on my knees and so it moves all the time. But I, um, I thought it would be fun to participate in that reality uh, TV show. And uh, it, it gives uh, people the way to see what it is to be an artist and also what it is to judge a work of art. And I know that there are some people in the art world who have been very critical of participating in such a program, but um, for me, I, I, there is, I think it's a very positive thing. And uh, when you can learn about something in a fun and entertaining way, that's so much the better. I think you were quite remarkable in that show, and I am somewhat baffled about how you got to be so excellent talking to artists and giving them very sincere, heartfelt, intelligent advice. Because when you went through the list of accomplishments, not, you know, mentoring artists wasn't one of the things you mentioned, yet on the TV series, I think you were thoroughly remarkable. How did that happen? 
you know, in, in our professional lives, we have to make judgments on a daily basis, uh, particularly when you are active on the art market. Uh, each decision uh, needs to be done instantly, and uh, each decision has financial implications. So if you uh, get it wrong, you, you learn quite fast. And uh, so you are just exposed to art on, on a daily basis, and you see so, so much of it that you, uh, you know, you form your opinion, where, whether it's valid or not is another question, but uh, you certainly uh, do have one. And uh, I love working with artists. I love uh, being in touch with artists. I find nothing more stimulating and uh, uh, then spending time with artists. And that's one of the great privileges of the professional path that I have chosen. It certainly is what I enjoy most about this course, that I'm, you know, empowering, working to empower artists is working with the artists themselves. I find it much more gratifying than working with collectors. I mean, collectors can be fascinating, but this is perfect. Um, you raised a question uh, or a statement a moment ago about art. Um, we did a webinar some time ago with Jerry Saltz, and I asked Jerry, and you know Jerry, I asked Jerry the question about who is art for, and he says it's not for, it's for anybody, but it's not for everybody. And, you know, it, it's sort of self-chosen, and I think that's true. And, you know, I want to talk about the macrocosm, the big picture for a moment, about how the art world is changing. And I'm real interested in, and I believe you are also, in making art more accessible to a larger audience. And because we believe that the experience of art, just even the looking of, at art, makes people better human beings, right? Well, I think the access to art is easier today, uh, thanks to uh, technical uh, innovations and the fact that we can now speak in a webinar is, is a proof of it. And um, uh, so there is no longer anything like somebody being in total isolation. I think a young artist, whether he's based in Russia, India, China, Brazil, or the United States, knows what's happening anywhere else in the world. He knows what his contemporaries are doing, what his contemporaries are interested in. And uh, that uh, information, level of information, makes it so much more interesting and exciting and stimulating. Yet one would want artists to come from their own experience, right? I mean, so there needs to be a mix of what's going on and the information they're accumulating internationally but also the physical experience and mental experiences they've had in their own lives as a, in terms of how they approach their artwork. Yes, uh, of course, it's always a combination of what you have inside you, plus all the influences that you pick up uh, with all the works that you see elsewhere. And all the great artists have been highly influenced by other artists and uh, are then uh, working those influences into something that then becomes truly personal and individual. And uh, so I feel whether you are an artist or a collector or in the, a curator, that the key is really to see, see, and see again. The more you look at, the better. How does it happen? Or well, maybe, you know, I mean, the artists in this group are between 30 and 80 years of age and have had a whole array of accomplishments or not. I mean, and there, there's everybody represented, but how does someone go from the kinds of artists you saw on the TV show, work of art, to having their work shown at auction? What's, what are, the, what are the, the variety of ways someone gets from point A to the end of the road? Well, there are so many different ways today that an artist can get exposure. And there are uh, websites on which uh, young artists can present their work, uh, such as the website of the Saatchi Gallery, uh, which shows thousands of artists' work from all over the world. Uh, you have the street art phenomenon, which has become global, with some artists uh, first getting recognition on the street, and then only eventually being picked up uh, by the traditional art uh, market, uh, then uh, you, you have, like in the music business, you have some musicians who first get uh, recognition on, on YouTube and, and only eventually get recuperated by the traditional music majors. 
And then uh, you have reality TV shows, as we just uh, discussed before. And of course, you still have the, the traditional way, uh, which is being exhibited uh, by by a gallery that shows your work and uh, by a gallery that believes in you and is going to make sure that uh, your work uh, gets seen by some of the key collectors and acquired by them and spreads your work into the right places. So there are many, many different ways. But uh, it, luckily, you no longer depend on just knowing the right uh, art dealers or the right gallerists in order to be able to uh, get some attention as an artist. Where, where, where do you call home? Where does your daughter think she lives? <laughs> I have an 18-month-old daughter that uh, travels with with me and my wife wherever we go, and uh, I always say that in her first 18 months she has seen far, far more of the world than I have seen in my first 18 years. Uh, so home is wherever I lay my hat. I lead a very um, mobile existence and uh, enjoy that very much. So whenever I stay too long in the same place, I begin to feel itchy. So typically your family travels with you? Uh, I do take my uh, family with me. We, 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 I work with my wife, so we are both in the same, uh, in the same company. So uh, we work together. That makes it easier. And uh, before our uh, young daughter goes to school, we can, of course, take her everywhere. Once she will go to school, it's going to be a different question. I remember the same thing when my kids were that age. It's fun. Um, now, so everywhere you travel, you see artwork and you see artists. Do you see artists and artwork on similar issues everywhere, or are there different issues, or both? I mean, wherever I go, I, I, I go and see galleries, uh, museums, uh, exhibitions. I, I try to visit artists uh, uh, that, that I know or try to get to know new artists. I uh, visit, of course, collectors, our clients. Uh, in most places, so one kind of melds into the other, and uh, there is no kind of system to it. It just happens uh, quite naturally. But I'm wondering if artists in like part of the United States compared to another part of the United States, compared to artists in Switzerland, compared to an artist in Iceland, compared to artists in China um, and India, are all wrestling with similar kinds of aesthetics and similar kinds of logistical issues, or if you see significant differences in some places? Well, you always see, uh, on one hand, the international impact, the fact that you can do whatever you want today, you can operate in any medium, uh, you have this openness in terms of being able to do basically anything, and on top of that, an artist does not need to be active just in one medium, in order to make it, uh, he can tackle uh, several different mediums uh, simultaneously. And uh, at the same time, of course, you have a, a strong influence of your local or, uh, or, or national culture. So an artist living in India or an artist living in China, uh, you, you will see to a large degree the, the tradition of, of, of their own cultural heritage in the same way that uh, a European or American art will, will, will show that as well. I feel in the United States, I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about museums now, that too many museums present a cookie cutter image of what they think important art is. They all have a de Kooning, they all have a Motherwell, they all have a Leger, they all have several Picassos. Um, and they don't show, I don't believe, enough, and I think that enough should be maybe up 20 to 30 percent of what's going on locally or nationally or regionally in, 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 within their sphere of influence. I think that a lot of people travel, and when we travel, we want a sense of what's going on in that community, and that more museums and um, culture programs in various cities should pay attention to their own intrinsic culture more than they are. How do you feel? Uh, I would agree when you say that uh, a lot of collections become stereotyped. I mean, that happens to be the case with private collections as well. 
So you, you, you see some private collections and you, you have all the usual suspects that are represented in those collections and then it just becomes, is it a good example or a poor example by X or by Y? And uh, I find that collecting is an artistic process in itself that uh, if it's well done, uh, shows the handwriting of the person that has put the collection together and uh, therefore should be completely like a self-portrait of that person and therefore completely different to one collection from another. And uh, nothing is more exciting than seeing a uh, collection that is not showing just the usual suspect, that is showing things that you haven't maybe seen or seeing juxtapositions that you haven't seen and make you experience new things as a result of it. I want to open this up to questions from others in a moment. You guys start thinking about your questions. Um, I've noticed over, you know, over the 30, 40 years I've been involved in the art world that various cultures come reach a certain level of maturity and then their artwork starts showing up in the contemporary art market. And, you know, more recently I can think about Russian art and I can think about Chinese art and now I'm thinking about Indian art. But I think with the Chinese art, and I remember, you know, maybe I didn't find the right Chinese artist when I was in China. My son was living in Beijing and studying there, and it wasn't particularly art that he was studying, but he said, Dad, you want to go meet some Chinese artists? And I said, sure. I have a sense that so many, of, and same thing with Korean art, too. So many, uh, you know, when you see these artists begin, they're creating for an external market, I thought, and doing it without, a lot of what I would consider sincerity, that they were doing it like, what does an American audience want? You tell me, I will paint it, and we will sell it, and we'll make money. And then over time, you know, I think the superior artist, the cream, rises to the top. And now the, you know, the artists who are getting acknowledgement in China, I think to a large extent, are those who deserve it. Um, I kind of wonder how your opinion about how a new culture or a new aesthetic or a new cultural aesthetic starts to make its mark in the art world and why it tends to usually, I guess it has to, I guess I'm asking. For entree, it has to be sort of universal before it gets specific. I'm not convinced that Ai Weiwei would have been as successful had we had as much awareness 20 years ago. I mean, the situation, for instance, between uh, India and China is, is a bit different, or, or Russia is yet different as well. The Chinese art market was really started by American and European collectors who all thought that uh, China was going to become economically strong, therefore that the uh, art done by Chinese contemporary artists was going to basically gain in value. And so uh, you had a number of collectors uh, who in America and in Europe started buying Chinese contemporary art. The ultimate pioneer was a Swiss uh, gentleman way back, uh, Mr. Uli Sig, uh, who was a businessman uh, living in China, and then he also was made a Swiss ambassador to China. And uh, he, in the uh, 80s and 90s, visited all these artists who had no audience, who had nobody uh, interested in what they were doing and nobody acquiring their works. And then in 2002, I believe, when uh, Harald Zeman, who was the curator of the Venice Biennial, uh, wanted to show uh, Chinese contemporary art, he went with Uli Sieg to China, and Uli Sieg introduced him to all of these artists. The rest is history, because then through the Venice Biennial, uh, an international art audience uh, was made aware of the, the, the very talented artists. Uh, that were in uh, China. Then a kind of a general rush in, uh, on all these artists ensued, and w then it's always dangerous. Whenever an artist becomes very, very successful, uh, the danger is that he then uh, produces works that satisfy what his public wants to see, or uh, uh, produces work that has proven to be uh, very popular. And that then creates a uh, creative uh, question because uh, some, some artists can cope with that and continue to be very creative and continue to have a work that evolves and continue to explore new ways. But uh, a lot of artists then just become purely repetitive and do the same thing over and over again. And so uh, with 
that initial wave of Chinese art, uh, it was a little bit like uh, export porcelain uh, way back, uh, something that was done to satisfy that very strong demand. Now, as you said, with all of these waves, um, once the wave settles, you have the truly great artists that stay, remain, and, and, and the rest to uh, disappear again. And uh, that is, you know, the same thing with most places. Now, in, in, in Russia also, initially, uh, the interest for Russian contemporary art uh, was started by non-Russian collectors. I had the privilege in, of organizing in 1988 the first auction ever uh, to take place in Moscow. And at the time, all of the buyers uh, came from uh, America and Europe who bought these works. Then, uh, meanwhile, obviously a, a, a market developed in, in Russia uh, with uh, affluence and interest for the arts uh, in, in Russia that is very strong. But very rapidly, uh, Russian collectors moved on to buy international art. And so the Russian contemporary art hasn't had the same kind of boom that Chinese contemporary art has had because uh, in China you have now hundreds, uh, thousands of new museums being built all the time and all these museums need to be filled. And so there is now very, very strong domestic demand for these uh, artists and uh, to get the best results for selling a top Chinese artists, you no longer sell these works in New York or London, but you sell them in uh, Hong Kong, Beijing, or Shanghai. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, we spoke a moment ago about making art more popular, having art be a greater influence. I want to talk in generalities about museums in generalities about the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. I don't want to talk about specifics because this discussion today will live in a recorded version for a longer period of time. Um, but I think you see in museums a battle between do we remain, is it primarily connoisseurship and scholarship we're after? Or is it after, are we interested in more people walking through the turnstile to pay to enter the museum? I think museums certainly the amount of money they get from the door, from the gate is under 20%, often under 10%, frequently around 5%. Um, should museums try to influence the public at large? I mean, what's the role in your mind of how museums should function today and how that's changing? You see, um, I, I think a museum can be all of these things. One doesn't preclude the other. Uh, you mentioned uh, the MOCA. I happen to think that uh, Jeffrey Deitch has a very exciting exhibition program that he has put together for the MOCA. I've just been in Los Angeles last week and have seen the exhibition currently held at, at the MOCA, uh, which is entitled Painting Factory. This is one of the most exciting exhibitions I've seen in a long, long time. It puts the spotlight on a, a generation of uh, abstract artists that all say that they have found their influence in some of Andy Warhol's more abstract works. And so you have very strong works by artists such as Wade Guyton, uh, Kelly Walker, Rudolf Stengel, uh, uh, Mark Bradford, Sterling Ruby. Uh, Taube Auerbach and, and more, and not only is it a really, really interesting selection of works, but each work is really of outstanding quality, and the installation is superb. Now, this is an exhibition which will remain incredibly important for years to come. Is this a crowd pleaser? No, this is not a blockbuster show that is going to uh, attract thousands of people to the museum, but it's a very serious, uh, solidly uh, thought through exhibition, which is truly impressive. Now, the same MOCA has done an exhibition devoted to street art, which was a huge popular success. Now, I applaud them for having done it, because you cannot ignore such a worldwide phenomenon, uh, all the children of 
collectors that I know, the one thing they're interested in is street art, and uh, it's a fascinating phenomenon. Um, and we we see how artists like uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat or uh, Keith Haring in the 1980s uh, started in the street and became uh, household names of uh, international contemporary art. And so it's not something that you can disdain. And if you take uh, an approach of wanting to show the best of street art on an international basis and really uh, put the spotlight on it, this is a great thing to do. So, um, as I say, uh, you can combine a program with exhibitions which will attract great crowds and maybe some other exhibitions that are uh, only going to attract a, a smaller, maybe more specialized crowd. One does not preclude the other, but I think uh, a, a director of a museum, an institution, should always put together uh, shows of great quality, uh, uh, make it in a very serious way, and that is what the MOCA uh, has been doing and will continue to do. And also, of course also uh, show their very, very fine permanent collection, it's an outstanding uh, permanent collection, which they own, and so that is of course a marvelous basis to work from. Fascinating. All right. Um, so you think it's possible to do both, and you can you can have a viable solvent museum that is responsive to its community and the public, as well as pursue things on a higher level. Uh, definitely. And then, of course, you have the responsibility for curating and, and looking after the collection that uh, is entrusted to you. So, and making sure that it, it, it passes on to the next generations in, 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 in an appropriate way. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. It's, I think it's an evolving story that isn't done at this point. I, I think that at any stage that there is always a uh, resistance to change. And uh, you would think that the art world would be the one that is most open to change. But at the same time, uh, there is something very conservative in the art world where people do not necessarily embrace uh, change that, that easily. You know, personally, for me, sometimes I wonder if I'm getting old and I look at things and I go, oh, that's silly. I'm not interested in it. That isn't art. And then other times I wonder if, you know, I look at something and I go, well, that's fascinating and viable and it's wonderful. So I'm not always sure from my own personal point of view if it's me who's becoming a fuddy-duddy when I look at something. Or I mean, I, I, I respond to street art and I find it interesting. I think perhaps I was reluctant to accept it as something that, you know, influenced my art and aesthetic ponderings. Um, but I've, I've yielded to that. So some, you know, for me, sometimes I don't know if it's a factor of age or a factor of quality in terms of my looking at and interpreting things. Well, well it, it's very interesting what you say, uh, because I think everybody has a direct uh, access to art of their own time. And I see it with collectors. Uh, they are normally the most successful at buying art of their own generation. You, you pick up what is really best in, 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 in your generation, whether it's an art or music or anything. And then uh, these collectors sometimes are still relatively astute at picking the right th making the right choices for the next generation, but then completely lose it when it comes to the next generation after that. And others of the country who, uh, no matter how old they are, continue to, you know, be with what is most current. I, I will never forget when I started in my career, uh, I was a young employee at Sotheby's, and there was a 94-year-old gentleman who came to see me. Uh, he wanted to sell his watercolors by Paul Clay that he bought as a young man because he wanted to buy uh, new work by Joseph Boyce. Now, buying work by Joseph Boyce uh, in the early 70s was a very, very bold thing to do. And uh, this man just kept all his life, he just followed what was being done and put all his energy into it. And it, it does require energy. 
I was a teenager during the 1960s, and of course you can say, wow, uh, how amazing there was all the Beatles, Bob Dylan, all of that happening at the time. But I listen every day to new music being made. There is as exciting music being made now than ever before, but it requires the energy and the interest and the curiosity to follow it on a permanent basis. And same thing with visual art. You just have to follow and make the effort and see what is happening today without any prejudices and not think, oh, wow, uh, what was done during my youth was just so much better or so much stronger. I was listening earlier this morning to some electronic music by a young composer who, hip hop ish, but a young composer, I think Sanchez, who is titling his compositions after star architects and doing the music as his interpretation of their architecture. Um, I thought, you know, that's the kind of thing yes. we're talking about. I haven't heard that yet. He apparently did a thing on, on Zaha Hadid, so I'm very exactly. yeah. curious to hear that. I look forward to hear it. And that's a great thing. It's, a, it's an old idea, you know, as Wazowski uh, paintings of an exhibition. Uh, music and art go very, very well side by side. And there's always been a kind of a mutual influence. And we uh, live in a time when these barriers between these disciplines are uh, gradually coming down. Uh, it's okay to be a great artist in different disciplines. Uh, for me, one of the greatest artists living today is Kanye West. I had the privilege of seeing his uh, concert that he gave together with Jay-Z, uh, Watch the Throne, recently. What the visual show uh, of that uh, concert beats a lot of work being done by many contemporary video artists. I mean, it, it was outstanding and and so you see that somebody like Kanye West uh, is not only a great musician, he's a great artist in, in different disciplines. And that's what is exciting about today because these prejudices are gradually coming down. It's, you, you can be good at one thing and you can be good at something else as well. We're going to have a whole discussion about that. Um, I'm going to resist. And I want, I want to use that as an opportunity. I mean, I'm interested in what kind of music artists listen to in their studio. I'm interested in how there's a, this interdisciplinary influence. But I want to talk about the advice that you give artists, um, you know, in, as an extension of the kinds of artists you saw on the TV show. And, you know, like, in a nutshell, what are the few kernels of wisdom that you think visual artists need to hear? I think that you should just listen to your inner voice, follow your own instinct, and work, work, work at it. And uh, you, you can see a lot of things, but at the end of the day, it's really your inner uh, obsession, your inner passion uh, that you should follow. And um, it's okay to look at a lot of things, but in the end, it's, you have it in, inside yourself. And I, I want to open this up to questions in a moment, after this question, I hope. Um, is it sufficient to make good artwork? Is that going to get you the attention that you need in the art world, or does one need to do more? It is sadly not sufficient, because uh, you, there are some artists that are very, very talented, but do not have the luck or the skills uh, to market themselves and, 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 and promote themselves. And, if you see some artists that are very successful, uh, you can see that they are very often very good communicators and very skillful at promoting their own work, whereas others are far less uh, talented at uh, promoting their own works. And so uh, if you don't have their talent, uh, it helps you if you are working with a gallerist or a dealer or somebody who does have that talent believes in you and will then, uh, you know, try and defend your work. Agreed. Beautiful. All right, let's take some questions. Lynn, go ahead. Lynn, I can't hear you. Are you there? I noticed you were on the phone. That may be part of it. Um, I'm going to oh, are you and I the only ones online? <laughs> no, but you were the only one. You and I are the only ones who are not muted so that... Um, I can mute everybody and unmute them as we go. Monica, you were the next person I saw. Go ahead, Monica. Uh, Simone, it's a pleasure to speak with you this morning. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm one of both 
clients are we're breaking up a little bit, Monica. Talk a little louder and a little slower, okay? US. And um, so I've. Monica, I'm going to skip past you. Type your question to me, and I will I'll, I'll ask it for you, okay? But type it to me, Perry. Take it away. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Simon, uh, for your contribution today to our wonderful workshop. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll ask one. Uh, do, do you have a, uh, uh, like the Haunch of Venison Gallery that is Christie's retail uh, uh, outlet? Do you also have that kind of uh, outlet? And um, I know you mentioned in one of the YouTube uh, videos I saw that anyone can go to auctions as an audience attendee. How would we do that? And then my third question is, how do you vet um, the bidder so that you know that you will get paid? So uh, I, I heard the first two questions. I, I, I did not hear the third one properly. But let me first answer your uh, first two, two uh, questions. Now, uh, yes, we have done. Uh, selling exhibitions as well as uh, just auctions and we used to do these whenever we didn't have auctions. For instance, uh, I'm speaking to you from our New York place on 450 Park Avenue. Uh, we have two exhibitions uh, currently because in July and August there are no auctions and so one of the exhibitions is called uh, Triumvirate. Uh, it shows the work of three uh, international designers uh, young designers that we greatly believe in and have given us the possibility of showing their works. One of them is uh, the Japanese artist Nendo, who's one of the most talented designers to emerge in the recent past. Uh, parallelly to that, we have a curated show which is called Rorschach, which is based on the Rorschach tests, and uh, so many contemporary artists have been influenced by the Rorschach uh, tests, uh, starting, of course, with Andy Warhol, and so it's an exhibition centering on that theme. And now, the more our auction activities have developed, the less we've been able to do these uh, gallery exhibitions at the same time. But, uh, of course, uh, it's something we're interested in, and uh, again, uh, doing auctions doesn't preclude uh, you from also doing uh, gallery exhibitions. Uh, your second question, if you may uh, remind me uh, what it was. How do you, uh, how do you, how would I attend a auction? Oh yes, auctions, uh, yes, uh, uh, auctions are completely accessible. Uh, so the best thing is if you go on the websites of the main auction houses and look at the uh, auction program and look at the exhibition times, these exhibitions are open to everyone, and in fact, there are fantastic opportunities to see works that then get, you know, sell, uh, disseminated all over the world, and that may not one may not have the opportunity to see again for many years. So, and you have the chance to see these works really close up. Uh, in the case of objects, you can even handle those objects. So it's really a, a wonderful opportunity, and I always encourage everyone to attend those exhibitions, regardless whether you are uh, intending or, or, or able to uh, participate in them. That is irrelevant. The, these exhibitions uh, are there for everyone. And uh, we occasionally uh, have even school classes that come and see these exhibitions, which makes me very, very happy. Uh, we also uh, try and make these exhibitions more fun by serving uh, cappuccinos and bagels in the morning by playing music during the shows and, and so on, just to make it a pleasurable experience. The only auctions where we have to be more restrictive are our main evening sales. Uh, these are the highlights of the season where we sell the most valuable works. There we have to make sure, uh, first of all, that the people who attend are the ones that are intending to bid, because what you want to prevent is the room being packed with uh, uh, people who just want to follow the auction, uh, and then there not being any room for the ones that actually are going to be the ones doing the bidding. So we 
uh, need uh, tickets for the evening sales, and we uh, make sure first that the tickets go to the uh, clients of the company and, and to those where we know that they have a track record of being regular buyers. But otherwise, most auctions are also totally uh, accessible, and again, I would encourage you to come and attend our auctions, our fun things, and uh, I love the atmosphere of the auction room, and I have attended many auctions uh, in different places, and I would encourage you to do that. How do you vet the bidder? How do you assess the bidder's ability to pay? Sorry, I, I have an equipment here that is not very good. I'll, I'll try and get closer to the to the computer to see if uh, I hear you. Perry, let me ask you, Perry. Perry wants to know how do you vet the buyer? How do you know that the buyer can fulfill their commitment? Oh, I see. Yes. So um, we, uh, you know, we will ask you what lot you're interested in, and if it's a, if it's an item uh, that is not, uh, you know, that that costs, let's say. Uh, uh, $2,000 or something like that, uh, uh, you, you, you can bid freely on it and then, of course, if you don't pay, then uh, we will put you on a blacklist and uh, you will not be allowed to bid again uh, in, in that auction. Now, with more, uh, with higher prices and obviously with some, some work sell for uh, big, big uh, amounts, and there, of course, we will have to ask for a financial reference. And so we will need a letter from your bank telling us that you're okay to bid on this uh, work by Richard Prince that is coming up or this work by Roy Liechtenstein or whatever. Thank you, Simone. Um, Monica is from India and is working to establish a, bring Indian art to the United States and some American artists to India which means she's doing a lot of education and hand-holding with her artists. And she wants to know, she was what was breaking up a moment when she was trying to ask a question. She wants to know how you would give advice to artists whose work shows up at auction for the first time, like an inferior work of art that, show, that is, doesn't sell with no, in a no-reserve auction, or an artwork that does not meet its reserve, or an artwork that sells below its estimated value, and or an artwork that sells insanely high. Um, what advice, what, would you, what wisdom would you share with artists who are encountering auctions for the first time? Of course, there is always a great anxiety, uh, I would imagine, on any artist uh, whose work uh, goes up for auction, especially if this is for the first time. Uh, we normally, uh, introduce some artists that have never been sold at auction before. But the artists that we introduce are artists where we do know that there already is a primary market. Uh, artists that have been uh, sold in uh, on the primary market in exhibitions where we know uh, who are the collectors who have been uh, buying their work, where we know that there is already a real demand for it. And so uh, people follow and, and, and look uh, to see which are the artists that we choose to introduce. And so over the last 10 years, uh, we have uh, introduced great many artists that have done fantastically well since. And I, I, I remember in 2001, we saw the work by uh, David Hurst with Cigarette Stops, which uh, made a, a record price of $600,000, and everybody said, wow, this is insane. Uh, uh, this is a crazy price. Well, meanwhile, that price has been beaten, I think, something like 300 times, uh, and uh, his, his works have, have gone from record to record, and uh, we, we have uh, been the first to sell works by uh, Mark Bradford, by Neil Ralph. We've been championing uh, works by Richard Prince. We were the first to sell a, a nurse by Richard Prince for a million dollars, and so on. So uh, now uh, that there is an anxiety, uh, uh, that is for sure, in the same way that there is an anxiety of anybody selling a work, uh, even if you're not the artist, if you consign a work to auction and you're selling it, you, uh, you are nervous beforehand because you don't know how it's going to sell and how well it's going to do. And we always advise the artists or the uh, collectors selling something not to be in the sale room, uh, because I think it is a nerve-wracking experience to follow it firsthand if you are the vendor. But 
uh, it is a very good thing for an artist to have a secondary market because you need, in order to have a proper market, you need the primary and the secondary market. Whenever you sell something privately, the only way you can justify the price that you're asking for it is by referring to a, a, a pr price that was obtained for a similar work publicly. So you do need the public market uh, to uh, gauge prices on the, on the private market. So there is always that false debate between uh, galleries and auction houses. Uh, the market does need both and the artists do need both. So for an artist never to be sold at auction and not in the secondary market is on the long run not a good thing because if you acquire a work, uh, of course you buy it uh, because you love it and you want to keep it, but you never know in life. You may have to sell it at some stage or you may need the money or you may uh, your taste may change and if you want to sell, you want to have the freedom of being able to sell wherever you want. You can either sell it back to the person who sold it to you, but equally you may want to put it onto the public marketplace and that is putting it up for auction. Great. Thank you very much. Lynn, who was trying to ask a question before, I don't know, have you read Michael Finlay's new book, The Value of Art? It's, it's really wonderful. I have not read it. No, uh, uh, it sounds great and I would love to read it. It's out a few months and he breaks it down into three different kinds of categories that art is, you know, some of it's the monetary, but as you and I both know, the spiritual and the passionate are much more important. But Lynn asks, how does one truly value, determine the value of a work of art? I think that's a really loaded question, so I'm just going to let you go with that. <laughs> well, I, 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 I will speak purely from the market perspective. Uh, the way you put an estimate on, on the work that is uh, being entrusted to you for an auction is uh, you base it on a similar work that was sold recently on the public market. So. Uh, it, any work that you come with, we, we look at similar works and see how much they have sold for, how does this work compare to them, and then we gave a range we, uh, between a lower and a higher estimate, and we say we expect it to sell between X and Y. But of course, uh, estimating is not a, an exact sign, and it's that the market that decides on the day of the auction uh, what the price is going to sell for. And so uh, markets, markets are in constant evolution and the work may be worth something X today and it will be worth something different tomorrow. Excellent. I think we need to let Simone go shortly, but I'm going to see if we can squeeze in a few more questions. John, are you ready? Yeah, actually, you've answered a couple of the uh, points I wanted to talk about. It's been fantastic. Um, but I, I, how... In, in your mind, uh, Simone, how, how what are the determining factors uh, in what makes an artist um, transcend from just being an artist who makes art to now becoming collectible? Uh, uh, if you if if Paul can just repeat the last bit because that's uh, I, I what didn't makes it, what, what makes what takes an artist from being a journeyman to being collectible. Uh, to be collectible. Uh, there, you see, very often it, it is the task of a gallerist to make sure that uh, the work is spread to different uh, places, both geographically and, and, and in terms of different collectors, because uh, you, you have artists that uh, have a local base and sell their work to a small group of individuals locally, but that is not going to help uh, creating a active collecting base for the future. So uh, if you have a good uh, gallerist, he will make sure that he sells your work to as many different collectors as possible. That's an important point that is not concentrated on very few hands. And also that there is a geographical spread uh, of these collectors. So uh, if you have an exhibition with uh, 35 works, 
there's galleries who will make sure that uh, some of these works are sold to American collectors, some are sold to Asian collectors, some are sold to European collectors, some are sold to other parts of the world. And that will ensure that in the long term there is going to be a more international demand for those works than uh, concentrating all the works in, in one location. I always take some examples, uh, for instance, uh, uh, there's a Swiss example, uh, since I'm Swiss, there's a fantastic artist called um, Hodler, Ferdinand Hodler, who is uh, totally unknown to most people who are not Swiss. In Switzerland, he's like a national hero. There will be a fantastic exhibition devoted to Ferdinand Hodler at the Neue Galerie in uh, New York. He was a contemporary of Klimt and of Schiele, and, but 98% of his work is in Swiss private collections, and it's for that reason that he's not widely collected and uh, widely known, despite his amazing artistic quality. Alberto Giacometti is the exact opposite. Um, he is uh, known the world all over. Uh, you find his works in museums all over the world. You find his works in collections all over the world. And that is because initially his dealers were selling the, uh, his works to international collectors and spreading it right at the start. Uh, or a, another example is a Russian example, the difference between Marc Chagall and uh, Pavel Filonov. Uh, Marc Chagall is known the world over, his works will be found all over the place, and he's a household name, whereas Filonov, very few people will ever have heard of him. Now, Pavel Filonov is an outstanding artist. Uh, who uh, uh, comes from St. Petersburg and, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he was in, in the siege of Leningrad and he donated and left all his work to the Russian Museum in uh, St. Petersburg. So the only way to see work by Filonov is to go there. When you see it, you see it's outstanding, but uh, he hasn't had the luck of having dealers who spread his work uh, uh, to various collectors. To a large extent, Simon, it seems, I mean, aside from being a mentor on a TV show, are there times that you find new artists' works that doesn't have something to do with an art gallery? Yes, I mean, you, you see uh, works, I mean, what is interesting is to see uh, art schools, uh, to see the exhibitions when when the students finish the, the year, uh, to, to look at those exhibitions, uh, it, it's, there's nothing more fascinating than to look at the work of young artists. And, and there are uh, so many uh, artists, and, and, and that is the difficulty for a young artist to get exposure. And so that's why it's important to try and get exposure for, for an artist. And then eventually, uh, the, the problem we have today is that we have too much choice. Uh, there is a so much overload of uh, possibilities of uh, artists that you could be interested in, and, and therefore uh, you have the influence of tastemakers uh, on on the not only the art market but on the art world. And uh, it would be a fascinating topic to see who are the tastemakers in today's art world, uh, who are the most influential people in uh, shaping the general taste of institutions of, of, of the market. And very often these taste makers are not people who are directly in the art world itself. It, it, it can be major collectors, it can be uh, well-known figures uh, who are outside of the art world but who show a particular interest in an artist and uh, as such become taste makers. Is there such a thing as bad exposure for an artist? <laughs> that is always the, the, the question, whether bad exposure is better than no exposure. Um, you know, right. something can be said that it could be the case. All right, let, can we take two more questions and then wrap it up? Is that all right with you, Simone? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Um, let's go with Joyce and then we'll end with Sam. Um, okay, Joyce, your turn. Simone, nice to speak with you. Um, I had a question, um, uh, several questions. Uh, does an artist ever put up their work for auction? That's one question. The second wait, question wait, wait. Let's break these down and deal with the most important ones, and let's assume that's one of them. Simone, did you get the question? Do artists ever individually put up their own work for auction? 
Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Now, in America and in Europe, the uh, tradition is that artists are represented by galleries and that they therefore don't uh, you know, go directly into the marketplace and so uh, works by them only come on the market uh, once they come on the secondary market, i.e. if somebody has bought a work in, in a gallery of the primary market and that person then decides to sell it, that's how it then comes onto the secondary market. But uh, in Asia or uh, in, in Latin America or, or, or any place outside America and Europe, there isn't that uh, tradition and so many artists there like to be able to have the freedom to uh, play the market directly and so you have a number of uh, these artists who uh, actually do like to sell a work directly and uh, of course you know the example of uh, Damien Hurst who broke the, that taboo uh, in um, London in uh, 2008 when he did an exhibition, an auction uh, of entirely new work uh, that went directly to the auction block instead of going uh, first through the primary market. All right, Joyce, can you ask one more and then so we don't take up too much of Simone's time? Sure. Thanks. Um, I was wondering in the secondary market whether uh, the artists get any residuals. Hmm, the Residual Royalties Act, Bois du Suite. Uh, can you repeat it because uh, I have very bad equipment here. So. <laughs> Joyce asked about the Droit du Suite and the Residual Artists Royalties Act and do artists get any money in when something sells in the secondary market? Well, there is the Droit du Suite in uh, most European countries, uh, uh, I mean in all the common market European countries. It, it doesn't exist in Switzerland, it doesn't exist in the uh, United States except in uh, California, I believe, and um, uh, now, you know, with the Droit de Suite normally it benefits the, the most successful artists already. Uh, it, it's those artists that are at the top of the heap who then, uh, on top of that, um, make m even more as a result of the Droit de Suite. The Droit de Suite in Europe is capped at a certain uh, uh, level, and um, uh, it's interesting, a few years ago they tried uh, to introduce a Droit de Suite in Switzerland and then there was a votation about it and it was voted against because some of the best known artists in the country like uh, Jean Pingelly at the time, he sadly no longer amongst us, uh, took pu public position against it and uh, uh, saw that it was being actually counterproductive because when a work by an artist sells uh, very well on the secondary market, uh, even if the artist doesn't get anything directly from it, his primary market directly uh, benefits from it. Uh, because uh, it, whenever you see that there is a strong secondary market for an artist, automatically his primary market will be uh, much stronger as a result of it. Fabulous. Good answer, good question. Thank you. Um, Sam, your turn and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, Go ahead, Sam. Thank you, Simon. Uh, how would you uh, go about finding the right person to promote your painting, uh, one's painting in, in today's market, today's art world? Uh, thank you so much. Again, I will uh, rely on Paul repeating the question. I'm so sorry because... How does an artist find a proper representative slash dealer for their artwork? I think that uh, the important thing is to try and participate in uh, group shows or uh, in, in to show your work on websites where you can show it and uh, try and get uh, museum curators or gallerists to see your work. You really want to uh, get the attention of somebody who is either a gallerist or a curator who can then uh, defend your work and uh, do something about it. And I know that this is the most difficult step there is and, and as I told you by uh, at the beginning of this pro uh, webinar, uh, that was my, my own difficulty uh, when I wanted to become an artist was uh, I didn't know anybody and I tried 
uh, to show my work and just to get your work shown is the most difficult thing because the top galleries are all phenomenally busy and it's like if you go around with a CD that you want somebody in the music business to listen to, they are overloaded with uh, tapes and, and downloads that they receive from everybody and uh, the, it's very difficult to get even somebody to listen to your, to your music. So uh, that is the most difficult step, uh, the biggest step to take and uh, once you've been able to take that first hurdle, all subsequent hurdles are going to be much, much lower. Beautiful. And then one last question, Simone. Somebody asked, and I think it's a nice way to end this, are there particular places you read, particular books you read, particular magazines you read online or physically to stay abreast of the art market? Yes, uh, I, I think there are great magazines that you can read uh, that inform you on what's happening in the art world. Uh, art Forum is a great one because uh, it gives you a fantastic overview of what's being shown in galleries all over the place. Not only that, but it has ads by galleries from all over the world. That I, I love it just to look at the ads because each ad is, is an artwork in, in, in a certain way and you, you learn so much just by looking through it. And then you have uh, uh, magazines like Art and Auction, uh, Art News, uh, Art in America, Interview. I mean, you have so many of these magazines that are interested, interesting, but uh, very often you get great um, information on art in non-art magazines, uh, in, in, like lifestyle magazines or fashion magazines. I mean, Vogue or uh, W or, uh, uh, or some of the magazines, uh, Vogue France or Vogue Italy, are magazines in which you always have amazing information on what's happening in photography or art. Then in terms of websites, uh, you can go on to uh, Art Info, uh, which is always very inform of informative in terms of activities uh, in the art world. Uh, the art newspaper has a, uh, either you can read the art newspaper or you can go on to their website. Uh, you have things like Artnet or Artspace, um, uh, Art News I, I mentioned earlier. So, uh, and then of course in, in, in the main uh, national uh, newspapers, uh, I mean the New York Times or the uh, the Los Angeles Times or the main uh, magazines like uh, New York Magazine, New Yorker, uh, etc. It's just to look at all of it and <laughs> devour all of it and again the more you follow the more you get into it. Simone, this has been absolutely fabulous. I value your presence in the art world. I think you are intelligent knowledgeable, accessible, with an encyclopedic thirst. Is that a proper adjective? With, an, with, you know, with encyclopedic knowledge and a hungry thirst for more information and quality in the art world, I think you bring art to more people. Um, you know, I really value your participation with us in this webinar this morning. I'm unmuting everybody so we can hopefully everybody can say thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a very, very pleasure. Great. We'll be in touch. Thank you again. All right. Thank you. Simon, thank you. And stick around a moment. I have something else to say. Okay. Thank you. That's perfect. Um, <laughs>